I immediately yelled to my team members to get online and prepare to bound. I yelled at the 249 gunner on my right to open fire, but all I heard was silence. I couldn't see him because of the tall grass, but I knew his weapon must have malfunctioned. The squad leader was directly behind me, and I told him that we had two enemy directly to our front and that I was going to bound through them. I turned to my left and told the guys on that side to switch to burst mode and gain fire superiority. If we didn't move fast and hit hard, the Op 4 was going to get away. Hey everyone, welcome to my Ranger School adventure where I'm going through every single day of my time through the U.S. Army's Ranger School. In the last video, which you can see here, I covered the first eight days of the Darby phase, which consists of the demolition classes and the Darby Queen obstacle course and the cadre led and cadre assisted sticks lanes. In this video, I'm going to cover the first day of graded patrolling where I got my first go on in a leadership position on a patrol. Please hit the like button to help other people find these videos and subscribe so you don't miss new videos when they come out. Okay, this is the first day of graded patrols during the Darby phase. One of the most frustrating things at Ranger School is that you don't know if you passed your patrol until the last day of the phase. You're always counseled shortly after your patrol and given sustains and improves, Sometimes you can tell from the sustains and improves if you got to go or not. If your sustains are two or more principles of patrolling, you probably got a go. Conversely, if your improves are two or more principles of patrolling, you probably got a no-go. And just to refresh your memory, the five principles of patrolling are planning, reconnaissance, security, control, and common sense. And if you'd like a separate video that kind of explains these five principles of patrolling and goes through them and kind of what they look like, um, just leave a comment down below and, and let me know if that's something that you'd be interested in seeing. Anyway, the day started like any other. The previous day, we had been given our assignments, and I was very pleased to discover that I was the alpha team leader. Having failed miserably the first time around, which we talked about in the last video, I was determined to fix my errors and get a go on this patrol. We woke up around 0430. The squad leader and the RTO ran up to the cadre building to receive the op board. It's not like ROTC where it's read to you and you record it. They just hand you a paper copy of the platoon order. The squad leader, Rob brought the op order down and started dividing up the responsibilities for the Warno. My main concern was getting the terrain model squared away and making a good route plan, which were my primary responsibilities anyway. Rob and I didn't really know each other during iBullock, but we became very close during Ranger School. He was a West Point graduate and the son of a retired Air Force colonel. He was a little taller than me and had a very deep, very odd voice that seemed to come from the deepest part of his throat. He was methodical and detailed and was always willing to lend a hand on any task that needed to be accomplished. We became fast friends and helped to pull each other through some of the very worst situations. In fact, without him, I may not be wearing the Ranger tab today, and we'll learn about that story when we get to the Florida phase. Anyway, the amount of detail the RIs want to see wanted to see in the terrain model was beyond ridiculous. I won't go into too much detail, but to get it to the proper standard required all the time from the receipt of the op order all the way until the very moment the op order was briefed. What complicated matters was that our sand table was full of rocks, which made forming the terrain very difficult. However, we had spent several hours over the past few days taking time to remove the rocks from the sand table and making it as smooth as possible. We also decided to pour massive amounts of water onto the very large sand table in order to help mold the terrain. This process took a skilled eye and someone who paid close attention to detail. I put two of my most trusted guys on it. I did not want the terrain model to be a disaster like it was the last time I was responsible for it. Luckily for me, we were conducting this operation in the exact same area where we had conducted several of our practice runs. 
We knew where the unmapped open danger areas were and how to avoid them. But we had also discovered that Rodney was an extremely skilled navigator. He had been in a long-range recon and surveillance unit in the 82nd Airborne and was a recent graduate of the Recon and Surveillance Leader Course, which is known as RSLIC, which places a very large emphasis on land navigation. I tasked him to plan and brief me on the route and to aid me in navigation. I was confident that with his help, we would avoid the problems we encountered last time. When we were ready to brief the Warno, in walked none other than Captain Keller. A little background on Captain Keller. He was friends with Sergeant First Class Stabenow, who was my Ibolic platoon sergeant. He actually came and talked to us in Ibolic about being, a, a, being successful at Ranger School. The only problem that I saw was that he declared when he came down that he hated officers, even though he was one. I always thought his relationship with Sergeant First Class Stabenow was odd, and I don't really know why they were friends or how they knew each other. I don't think Captain Keller remembered me, but I knew that the things he was focusing on were the five principles of patrolling. I was determined to display those to the best of my ability. The squad leader briefed the Warno. He was critiqued by the RI, Captain Keller, and we began writing the op ward. I don't remember what I did specifically, but I know I oversaw the terrain model and assisted the squad leader in writing the op order. During the briefing, the other team leader who's drill sergeant Donnie and I stood at the front and woke up the Rangers who inevitably fell asleep with no more than three hours of sleep a night for about the past week. It was no surprise that guys were going to fall asleep. We would politely whisper in their ear for them to stand up and move to the back. But even when guys were standing, including myself, we would fall asleep during the two and a half hour long briefings. The squad leader finished and was critiqued on his op board and we prepared for movement. We got off the trucks at the drop-off point and once again headed into the wood line. I was expecting to take contact right off the bat, so I was hyper alert, scanning my surroundings. We didn't take contact. We kept moving for about 500 meters when we finally took contact to our 12 o'clock on the other side of a small clearing. This was a godsend. Op 4 never hit us from the front. In fact, I think it was the entire time all of Ranger School where we got hit from the front. They always hit us from the side or from the rear. But because they hit us in the front and there were only two of them, I could bound my team straight through them and take them out quickly and decisively. I immediately yelled to my team members to get online and prepare to bound. I yelled at the 249 gunner on my right to open fire, but all I heard was silence. I couldn't see him because of the tall grass, but I knew his weapon must have malfunctioned. The squad leader was directly behind me, and I told him that we had two enemy directly to our front and that I was going to bound through them. I turned to my left and told the guys on that side to switch to burst mode and gain fire superiority. If we didn't move fast and hit hard, the Op 4 was going to get away. I got up and sprinted over to the 249 gunner, who I could see was messing with his weapon. I helped him correct the malfunction and began giving commands to my team to bound. Sure enough, we bounded straight at the enemy. Our actions were decisive enough that the RI radioed the Op 4 and told them to die in place. We bounded through and cleared the dead bodies and established an LOA about 20 meters past where the last dead Op 4 was. The squad leader then cleared through with the other team. Once he was in place, I ordered my team to follow me back to the rucks so we could pick them up and continue the mission. I quietly reminded them that we were going to take indirect fire sh shortly, and that when we did, to stay in formation and run for 300 meters, which was our standard operating procedure. My only concern up to that point was that the RI asked me to point where I was on the map, and I was the only one in the group without a map. We had 16-man squad, but only 15 maps, and somehow I was the one that ended up without one. He scoffed at this and stormed off. I was a little worried. Sure enough, we took indirect fire. My rangers responded perfectly, and we ran at a light jog for 300 meters before stopping to regroup and take accountability. As it turns out, the 249 gunner and Bravo team was carrying over 1,000 rounds of 556 Link in his rucksack. He was barely able to stand. The Bravo team leader took that time to redistribute the ammo so the poor 249 gunner would not die from exhaustion. We picked up and began to move again. 
the terrain was really crappy and we had to constantly shift between the wedge formation, the modified wedge formation and the file. But we stayed on course and moved at a good pace and made it to the short halt position. The new chain of command was put in and I was relieved. I knew I had done all I could. The mission, which I neglected to mention earlier, was a recon mission. Luckily, this time, I was not on the recon team, so I just got to chill in the ORP. Chill is more of a little literal term because in November in Georgia, as soon as the sun goes down, the temperature drops significantly. I got close to one of my ranger buddies, and we tried to use our body heat to keep each other warm. After the recon, we gathered on the, object the objective, did the sensitive items layout, conducted an AAR, and prepared to move. Little did I know that the route I had planned that morning would lead to one of the most miserable move movements we conducted in all of Ranger School. Needless to say, it was already pitch black outside. I also didn't have night vision goggles. Our squad only had 10 pairs, and I was one of the six without them. We began moving downhill towards a very dark low area. It wasn't indicated on the map, but that low area was a swamp, a big swamp. This was the type of swamp you see in horror movies. Crazy sounds, horrible smell, no light, disorientation, and your feet are wet the whole time. It was terrible, and I swear on my life, the second I tried to make the best of the situation and said, at least it's not raining, the heavens opened up and the downpour began. It was like something out of a horrible, really bad movie. We slipped and sloshed and waded our way through the swamp for over an hour before finally ending up on some high ground. The only problem was that in an effort to get us out of the swamp, the point man had gotten us extremely lost. We were up on top of some hill somewhere on Fort Benning. The squad leader ordered a short halt, and we all pulled security while he tried to figure out where we were and how to get us to the link-up point. The time was about 2200. We had never been on a mission this late before. I was really starting to feel myself slip into utter exhaustion. When you're put into a leadership position at Ranger School, your brain releases every ounce of energy-producing chemicals that it has, and you start moving about a mile a minute. All of your senses are heightened, and you feel invincible. But when the leadership changes and you're no longer in charge, you crash hard. With the rain and the draining movement through the swamp, I was really starting to go downhill fast. My team leader got done getting briefed by the squad leader, and he told us we had over two kilometers to go. We were really off course. Our movement was only supposed to be about 1,800 meters from the objective, and we were already way behind schedule. I don't remember clearly, but I think because of the rain, the link-up site might have changed. Regardless, that night was the first night I really felt like I couldn't go on. But put yourself in my shoes. How could I quit? Even if that's what I decided to do, I still had to walk to the link-up site to get on the truck. Quitting would have been pointless. It, it wasn't even really an option. The only time I could have quit would have been back at Camp Darby. But by then, I would have been able to go down to the planning bay, eat something, and warm myself by the burn barrel. It was during this miserable time that I thought back to my days in philosophy class where I learned about the Stoics and their philosophy. I decided to try to combat my mental state by simply accepting that I had absolutely no control over my circumstances and that the only thing I could control were my emotions. I simply accepted as a total reality that I had no control over my own circumstances. I just had to accept them and drive, drive on. This proved to be an extremely reliable strategy until I got to mountain phase, but we'll discuss that later. <clears throat> we walked and walked and walked sometimes on roads to expedite movement, sometimes parallel to roads to aid our navigation. I don't remember getting to the link-up site or getting on the truck or getting off at Darby, but I do remember being pulled aside by Captain Keller that night before we headed down to the planning bay to get counseled on my leadership. I don't remember what he said, but I remember thinking that I was on the fence. I couldn't tell if he had given me a passing grade or not. But it wasn't until the very last day at Darby when I had learned that he had given me a go and had given me a pass to the next phase. 
Okay, that's the end of my first graded patrol, which ended up being a go. In the next video, we're going to go through some other stories during the Darby phase. If you have any specific questions about the Darby phase uh, that you'd like to have answered, just go ahead and, and drop them in the comments, and I'll try to get to them in the next video. Other than that, uh, please check out the link in the description for the distro newsletter where I write about leadership and I write about books and I, I write about a lot of really, I think is interesting stuff. Um, it's been growing really fast. It's free for people in the military. Uh, so just respond to the intro email after you sign up, uh, make sure to use, if you're in the military, make sure to use a civilian email account. It doesn't work great with the army email system, uh, but it's for everybody. It's not just for people in the military. So go ahead and click in the link, drop in your email and uh and sign up for that Just don't forget to like and subscribe and i will see you in the next video thanks so much rangers lead the way